In this video, I'm going to show you how to fix a wine fridge when your wine fridge is not cooling. Find out how coming up next. What's going on folks? Kendall here with Benoist for Pros and Joes, helping you simplify the renovation and remodeling process. On this channel, we do hands-on product, tool, and gear reviews, as well as renovation tip and strategy videos. So if you're interested in renovation, remodeling, repair, or real estate, then subscribe because this channel and this content is for you. So in today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to fix a wine fridge when it stops cooling. And so this is something that can happen at any point when you own your wine fridge and it puts you in a bit of a dilemma because wine fridges have a wide price range and sometimes the cost to have someone to come out and do a maintenance repair on it may exceed the cost or the value of the wine fridge itself. That's not always the case, but in any case, our tip today is going to be to try to save some cost. This is a relatively quick repair. So the first thing I want to do is describe to you the problem so that you can determine whether or not this is what you experience with yours. In order to do that, I'm going to plug the unit in first. So if you heard that, you heard the beep. We can see that the lights are on and you can see the temperatures. This is a dual zone wine fridge. So it's got one zone here at the top and then below the display, there's another zone. You got 72 degrees on the top and 71 on the bottom and it will probably begin to heat up as I let it run. But I just wanted to demonstrate that it's not cooling and that it is running though. So you can hear the motor running or something inside of it running. The lights and everything work properly. Uh, there is air blowing inside of it, uh, but it's not cooling. And so if you run into this, you also may hear a clicking sound and I'm trying to listen for it to see if I hear it do it. But as this runs, it sounds normal and then eventually I just hear kind of a clicking noise and as I watch the thermostats here, it's just talking. I think I just heard the noise go off, but we're at 72 and 71. As you can see, that one just creeped up to the bottom, just creeped up to 72. I'm going to be quiet again for a second just to see if we can hear that click because I just heard it again. <laughs> So if you just heard that, there was the click that I was just talking about. So I'm hearing that periodically, but that's it. And so if you hear that noise, then the repair or remedy that I'm going to show you may work in your situation and it's relatively cheap fix. So in order to do this, I'm going to spin the unit around and then we're going to go and look in the back side of it because that's where all of the work is going to be. So give me one second. I'll be right back while I spin this unit around. All right, so now we've got the unit spun around and we've got the power disconnected. And I want to show you how we're gonna access the parts that we need to be able to address. And so I'm gonna turn the camera down here. If we look closely here, you can see that this is our compressor. And next to the compressor, we've got this plastic housing because the parts that we want to address and the work that we wanna do is actually underneath this housing. So we have to be able to remove it. Now this housing has a metal clamp that runs over the top of it. And it's hard to see from here, but I'm gonna use a flathead screwdriver to be able to slip underneath it just so that I can pop it off and I can remove the plastic housing here. Just gonna kind of work gently there to remove it there. And then we're gonna take that off and then kind of shimmy it to get it out of there, figure out which way we can turn it to get it out of here and then we'll remove it. Just won't want to bend anything as we're trying to remove it. It's kind of crowded in here, so you kind of have to just kind of get it out the best way that we can. I'll let mine slip down in there accidentally. It's okay. I'm gonna be able to get it out regardless. Okay, so there we go. So when we take it out, you just want to make sure that when you take it out that you remember which way it fits. And so for this unit, the wide side was on the rear, not like this. And so I'm gonna just make sure of that as I set it to the side, and then we'll move on to the next step. And so here we have the component that we are wanting to address and remove, and that is the relay. So it's difficult to see it right here, and I'm not gonna try to put the camera all the way 
in there to see it because it's probably going to be in vain. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect this red wire from the relay and then I'm going to pull the relay off and take it out and then we can examine it and we can see exactly how it fits in there a little bit easier. Now sometimes your connections here may be able to be squeezed and come off. Other times they may be a little bit more stubborn to remove. This one is not that easy to take off because I'm squeezing it here and it's not just popping off. And so I'm just going to give it a little bit of a push here my screwdriver and the entire thing actually just came out. And so this is our relay piece that we were actually trying to remove. It's come all the way off with the connection still attached to it, which is actually a good thing. And so as we're still trying to pull this piece away, I'm just gonna kind of shimmy it, grab it firmly here and kind of shimmy it off, but it still doesn't want to come. So you don't want to put too much pressure on it. Just kind of want to twist the screwdriver. If you saw what I did right there, I kind of had it on there. It was stuck on there. And what I did was I stuck my screwdriver in here like this. And I essentially just turned the screwdriver like this to kind of pop it off. That way you don't provide too much pressure and break anything or turn your screwdriver or move uncontrollably. So now we've got the piece off and this is what it looks like. And so you've got these two holes on the back and you've got some pieces in the side of the, the unit here on the side of the compressor that actually go into these holes. And so I wanna go ahead and take this time to zoom in and let you see exactly what that looks like. So if we look in here closely, you can see that there are those two prongs and that's right where this unit was sitting. And we turn it around on the back side. those are the holes that were going in there. Now, what's important to note when you're doing this is that you need to make sure that the relay that you have in here is going to match up with your replacement relay because this is the part that we're gonna be replacing. I'm not sure if this indicates that it's burnt up or not, but if I shake this one, you can hear that something sounds like it's loose inside. And so when I flip this over, you can see that this has got a model number on it here. And then it's got some other markings here on the bottom. So when you're doing your research, you want to take a look at all numbers that you can find. Uh, if you've got a model or if you've still got the instruction manual from your unit, that'd be a great place to start. Um, you can probably find all the parts and diagrams and things like that online. So if you've got this piece in hand and you've got the model and serial number from the unit, you shouldn't have any problem being able to find a replacement component. It may, as I said, it may not look exactly like this one, um, but this is the part we're going to replace. And so we're going to set this to the side. And let me show you what the new one looks like. So here is the replacement one. It looks very, very similar. So if I hold them side by side here, you can see, let me see if I can hold them both. You can see that they look pretty much identical on the bottom as well as on all sides. And if you can look at them this way, you can see that the model numbers on there are the same. And so I'm not getting them mixed up here because I remember that this one has a bolder writing on it. And this is the one that I can shake and it makes noises while the new one doesn't make any noises. Now this part cost about 10 or $11, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe that it was relatively inexpensive to get it shipped. So that's probably the main thing that you wanna look at when you're trying to price a part like this, because it's so small and so lightweight, it's very easy to get overcharged on shipping. So you may wanna shop around mainly for that aspect of it, as well as trying to determine how long it's going to take for it to arrive. And so before we put this back on here, I'm going to go ahead and put my clamp on here first. Just going to go ahead and slide it on like that. Now, if you notice, that one went on much, much easier than the old one did. And so now we're going to go ahead and just push this back in here to our location here and make sure that we've got it lined up. 
make sure you've got it lined up over those prongs before you start pushing it in there because you want to be able to push it in there straight and make sure you've got a good fit on there. And so if I'm looking in there, I'm looking there closely to make sure that it fits in there snugly. And I've got it in there jam up, feel comfortable with that. And so now I'm going to take my housing here. Remember that I said that my housing cover is wider on the back. And so if I can figure out how to fit it back in here, we should be able to just pop it right back in there and we should be good to go. Okay. Took two hands to get it back in there, but now we can see that it is snug in there and it's good to go. And so that is pretty much it. We're gonna turn this unit back around and then we're gonna plug it back in. We're gonna see if it starts to cool down. Just as you saw me plug it in the first time, we should be able to tell pretty quickly because when I plugged it in before, the temperature immediately started rising. So this time when we plug it in, the temperature should immediately start to fall and you should probably hear a little bit more noise coming from the compressor because I'm not sure that it was running last time. So let's turn it back around and see if we've got success. All right, so you've got the unit spun back around now. Let's go ahead and plug it back in in three, two, one. Heard the beep, there we go. We're still at 72 on both sides. I think it's running a little bit louder now. It sounds like that compressor has kicked off if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we'll find out here in one second if we see the temperature begin to drop. This is an excellent option if you're trying to determine whether or not to try to salvage the unit or not, or determine if whether or not you want to have a repair person come out and take a look at it. This piece was approximately $10, as I said, and hopefully you won't have to pay another $10 to get it shipped. But just even worst case scenario, if it's costing you $20 to get it to you, that's much cheaper than buying a new unit. And it's also much cheaper than having a repair person come out and take a look at it. Worst case scenario, it doesn't work. And then you still are out of only $20 you can decide what you want to do based on that. So I look down here, we're still at 72 degrees on both sides. We'll give it another second or two here to see if it's going to drop. feel like it should. Not sure if it's going to drop on both sides at the same time or not. Let's see if we can count down to a temperature drop. 10, 9, oh, there we go. 71, 71. All right, guys, uh, we've got success. As I said, everything is working. I guess you guys probably want to see this thing light up like it was in the thumbnail. There we go. Really snazzy, right? Well, hopefully you guys found this video informative. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you guys on the next one.